in-person classes. Um, so it's it's wonderful to, to see you gather together. Um, as Marina said, I'm Carla Call. I am the director of the School of Theological Sciences at the Latin American Biblical University here in, in San Jose, Costa Rica. And I was asked to uh, present a lecture on our experience of working online during the pandemic. So that's what I will be doing. Um, Marina started us off in this lecture series uh, talking about uh, hospitality, uh, creating hospitable spaces on online education. Um, I want to use a different metaphor. I want to talk about weaving together a community, the process of drawing threads of different colors from different contexts together to form a pattern that supports life. Um, and uh, what I want to do in my lecture is to talk a little bit about the history of distance education at, at the institution that is now the UBL. We, um, we often talk about you know, this being forced to move online as, as moving away from classroom instruction, um, but we forget there's a movement the other direction that, that online education is actually quite an improvement over previous modalities of distance education. And it allows us to bring elements of classroom learning to the online experience. Um, I will talk then about our journey toward online education, uh, some of the things we learned along the way, and then how, the, how our work in online education really came to fruition during, during the pandemic and how we um, grew in so many ways, pedagogically and as an international community, um, and close with a very brief theological exploration. So, Thank you again for the invitation to share. <clears throat> um, this year, 2022, our institution is celebrating 100 years of providing theological education in Latin America. What today is the Latin American Biblical University was birthed by a faith mission with a continent-wide vision to spread an evangelical vision of the gospel. In October of 1921, Harry and Susan Strachan arrived in Costa Rica to set up the headquarters of the Latin America evangelization campaign. They believed the small Central American Republic provided the perfect launching point for taking the evangelistic campaign to countries throughout Latin America. And for those who haven't had a chance to visit our campus, um, This is what our campus looks like on the eastern edge of San Jose, Costa Rica. It's not a place I get to very often, not even once a week these days. Uh, we are still not back to in-person classes. From the beginning of, of their work, the Strachans realized that the task of evangelizing Latin America, as well as building up the churches that resulted from such evangelistic outreach required the training of Latin Americans. In October of 1922, the Women's Bible Training School was opened in San Jose with five members from El, five students from El Salvador and Costa Rica. Initially, classes in Bible and other subjects were offered during the evangelistic campaigns organized country by country. The women generally were not barred from participating in these courses taught by Harry Strachan and local evangelical leaders. It was considered much more appropriate for women to receive training in the stationary setting. Soon, however, men also wanted the opportunity to take part in the multi-year study process in San Jose. Eight Nicaraguan men who arrived in August of 1924 became the first male students of what was then renamed the Bible Institute of Costa Rica. For nearly 90 years of our century of existence, distance learning has been part of our institution's educational outreach. The evangelistic campaigns attracted people to the particular theological vision promoted by the Bible Institute of Costa Rica, but not everyone had the luxury of being able to travel to Costa Rica and spend several years. El Mensajero Biblico, the magazine published by the Bible Institute and circulated throughout Latin America, also fomented interest in theological studies. 
the question became how to respond to this growing demand. The Bible Institute of Costa Rica offered the first correspondence courses in 1934. Thus, the Bible Institute became one of the first, if not the first, institution in the country to implement distance learning. Though as Edgar Salgado has recently pointed out, this has seldom been really recognized in the official histories of distance education in Costa Rica. Materials prepared and printed in San Jose, 12 modules divided into four units, were mailed to men and women in different countries. Each module contained exercises that students were to write and send into San Jose to be graded. Students earned certificates for each course they passed, as well as a certificate at the end of the 12 courses. Courses by correspondence opened the possibilities for theological education beyond those who served as pastors or church leaders. The registration forms for these courses and the historical archives of the UBL report vocations as varied as medical doctors, farmers, mechanics, and housekeepers, among many others. The courses by correspondence continued when the Bible Institute became the Latin American Biblical Seminary in 1941. The name change reflected the higher academic level of the courses offered, as well as the continental focus of the institution. By the decade of the 1950s, the number of students enrolled in courses by correspondence had reached 434. In contrast, there were only 45 students taking classes in San Jose in 1950. In 1963, the Estebaeli began offering university level bachelor's degrees to people studying in Costa Rica, but the correspondence courses carried on much the same. Though the correspondence courses reached a greater number of people than the residential program, very little research has been done to track the impact of these courses and the people who participated in them. In the 1960s, the Latin American mission, the name taken in 1939 by the mission agency to which the SABLA belonged, sought to Latinize the structures of the institution it had founded. For the SABLA, this meant not only incorporating more Latin Americans into its faculty, but also efforts to engage more fully with the Latin American context. Already new theological impulses were surging through the continent as Catholics and Protestants began to ask why so much of the population remained so poor after decades of economic development. These church leaders were proposing new ways of doing theology. In its endeavor to train future church leaders to respond to the social crises in Latin America, the SABLA found an ally in the ecumenical movement, specifically the Theological Education Fund of the World Council of Churches. The SABLA became independent of the Latin American mission in 1971. This institutional autonomy coincided with the third mandate period of the Fund for Theological Education and its emphasis <clears throat> on the contextualization of theological education around the world. As part of its contextualization strategy, the SABLA re reorganized its dis distance program. In 1976, the SABLA launched its diversified distance program known as PRODIARES in Spanish, Programa Diversificado a Distancia. The program was inspired in part by the movement for theological education by extension. This movement had, a, had its genesis at, at the Evangelical Presbyterian Seminary in Guatemala in the early 1960s, as professors there wrestled with the problem of how to provide theological education across that country's multiple cultural contexts. The theological education by extension model combined printed materials with an inductive methodology, small group discussions, and the incorporation of practical experience in ministry. Prodiades offers a flexible academic pro offered a flexible academic program that allowed students to combine a number of educational modalities in their path toward a bachelor's degree in theology or in, in pastoral ministry, the same level of degrees offered in San Jose. Such modalities included <clears throat> distance courses offered by the SABLE and courses offered by local institutions, as well as processes for assigning academic credit for practical experiences in ministry. As Prodiatis expanded, the SABLA developed relationships with a series of institutions throughout Latin America who offered Prodiatis courses using materials provided by 
<clears throat> the SA Ballet. In 1997, the SA Ballet became the Latin American Biblical University, or UBLE, an institution of higher ed learning recognized by the Costa Rican government. The decentralized model of the new university sought to combine the strengths of the SA Ballet's residential and distance programs. Students were able to do the majority of their studies within their own context. Various institutions around Latin America functioned as branches of the UBL, offering UBL courses with materials provided from San Jose. Faculty members also traveled to the various branches to offer intensive courses. Students who did not live close to an institution offering UBL courses had the option always of taking distance courses directly with the UBL. During brief, period, brief or not so brief periods of study and residence in San Jose, students were able to interact with the UBL faculty as well as students from other cultural contexts and ecclesial experiences in the classrooms. Time in San Jose, Costa Rica also allowed students to work in the Enrique Strachan Library. By 2012, 270 degrees had been awarded to women, women and men by the UBO. During the same period, hundreds and hundreds more throughout Latin America had taken UBO courses at one of the regional centers. In that year, however, the Ministry of Public Education here in Costa Rica determined that there was no basis in Costa Rican law that allowed the UBL to provide academic credit for courses held outside of national territory. Overnight, we lost all of our branches. Even before the government's decision eliminated the possibility of working with our branches outside of Costa Rica, the decentralized model was showing some strain. A growing number of institutions around Latin America were beginning to offer university degrees in theology which gave people another option for theological studies. Due to shifting priorities and limited resources of several donating agencies, the scholarship funds on which the residency program depended were diminishing. However, the UBL remained committed to providing theological education to people throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. The UBL was still authorized to offer distance courses. Students registered directly through the UBL, once again, course materials were sent through the mail or often carried by hand by people who were traveling. Students submitted their coursework now via electric email. In the next step, digitized materials were placed on our server. Students were sent a link which allowed them to download the course readings. For people in places without easy access to the internet and email, in particular Cuba, course materials could be copied onto a CD and sent. At times, direct contact was made by professors with individual students via Skype at that time. Um, but there was a, yet no way for students to interact with one another. At this time, online education, which of course had advanced in other contexts like the United States, was just beginning in Costa Rica. Our team explored the available options for an online platform and settled on Moodle. Um, imagine many of you are familiar with Moodle an advanced and complete platform that is fairly user-friendly. Faculty members received some initial training from the National University for Distance Education here in Costa Rica on how to use the spaces and tools on the platform to develop courses. Looking back, our first courses were lackluster affairs for small groups of students. With the platform serving primarily to distribute digitized course materials and receive student work. Neither students nor faculty had yet developed the skills and discipline to use interactive tools like, such as forums. The platform did provide a framework that allowed professors to structure um, interactions with students, um, which for me meant at least I wasn't getting phone calls at six o'clock in the morning any longer from students in the Caribbean. As the UBL began moving our education offerings online, we realized that it was not just a question of adopting a new technology. We needed to think very carefully about the pedagogical model we wanted to implement online. <clears throat> Inspired by the work of Brazilian educator Paulo Freire, the UBL had long privileged a dialogical pedagogy centered on students and their needs. <clears throat> As the SABLE became independent from the Latin American mission, 
The institution embraced much of the methodology of Latin American liberation theology. No longer did the Acevedo seek to transmit to students an imported theology through a banking model of education. Those who came to the Acevedo to study needed to be able to construct their own theologies in response to the needs of their communities. As a first step, they needed tools with which to analyze the social processes that were generating different forms of exclusion in their context. <clears throat> Exegetical tools and hermeneutical models allowed students to inter interpret the biblical text for themselves. Students were encouraged to elaborate their own theological responses and develop pastoral strategies for transforming their churches and communities. Professors accompanied this process as facilitators of a learning community that together sought to discern God's presence in history and proclaim the good news of God's reign of justice and peace. Students who came to the classrooms of the UBL from other institutions were often amazed to see professors sitting around a table with students engaged in dialogue. Students discovered that their experiences and their opinions were an important part of the learning experience. How would it be possible to maintain this pedagogical disposition as courses moved online? Through a process of study and faculty training, the UBL adopted the community of inquiry model. This framework based on constructivism and collaboration was developed for online education by Garrison, Anderson and Archer. It continues to be a dialogical model so now the dialogues are mediated by technology in different ways to facilitate learning. <clears throat> the framework posits the interaction of three presences in the educational experience. <clears throat> Social presence refers to the interaction among students and their engagement in the process of building a community. Cognitive presence refers to both the course materials, which have diversified far beyond the text in the original model, and the structure of the process of inquiry supported by course materials. <clears throat> As the teaching presence, the professor designs and facilitates both the social and cognitive processes. The community of inquiry model requires the active participation of all members of the learning community. Through each course we offered online, we made this model more our own. And here's a, a diagram of this. Uh, model, um, <clears throat> very Trinitarian. Yeah? Our pedagogical model has come to fruition during the pandemic. We had some classes operating online when the Costa Rican government ordered all institutions to suspend in-person classes in mid-March of 2020. Unlike many other universities here, we did not have to scramble to figure out how to continue our classes. In some cases, those studying in San Jose were incorporated into existing online courses. In other cases, a new course was set up for the students in Costa Rica. This change, of course, was felt most acutely by students who had recently come from another country, particularly Peru, to take courses in residency. <clears throat> When the second term of the academic year started in May, we were surprised by the growing demand for our courses. People who found themselves in lockdown in various countries suddenly had time to study. In the context of the pandemic, it was impossible for churches to operate as they had been doing. In addition, many long held theological certainties suddenly seemed a lot less certain. Perhaps theology would be able to provide some new answers. With the support from our donating agencies, we were able to redirect our scholarship funds, usually designated for room and board as well as academic fees for students and residents, to provide scholarships to cover the cost of online courses. At the same time, some students in San Jose decided to suspend their studies until they could return to the classroom. As of May of 2022, we are still waiting to go back to in-person classes. <clears throat> The pandemic impacted our educational project in various ways. It spurred us to become more creative in our online courses as we sought to engage students more fully in their learning process. It allowed us to provide intercontextual theological education in real time. 
In response to student needs, we created an online pastoral care program that supported students in their individual contexts while building a stronger international community. The pandemic forced us into innovation. It also overcame the last faculty resistance to teaching on our platform. Now we had no alternative. With larger groups of students online, it has become easier and easier to encourage interaction. Imagine, if you will, the Council of Nicaea held in a digital space. The Imperial Messenger sent out a video invitation to bishops throughout the empire. The partaking bishops were instructed to post their arguments to an online forum. They could make their submissions in writing, in an audio recording, or in video. Participants were to respond to each of the postings to evaluate the pervasiveness of the arguments, all under the watchful direction of the emperor who was moderating the forum. Though the online version was not quite as theatrical as reenactments done in the classroom, students were able to develop profound arguments. Another session of the same History of Christianity course asked students to build an online museum dedicated to, to the Eastern Orthodox churches using a wiki, a collaborative tool on the Moodle platform. Each group of students working under a designated student curator explored the history and current situation of the Coptic church, the Syrian Orthodox Church of Antioch and related churches, the Eastern Syrian Orthodox Church, the Armenian Church, or the Church of Ethiopia. Students combined maps, images, texts, and videos found on the internet with materials of their own production out of their own research. The technical director, in this case, my student assistant, sent out digital tickets for the opening of the museum, not only to the students in the class, but to other faculty and students as well. Visitors and students alike were encouraged to leave their comments in the visitor's book. There's a, a comment function in, in the wiki. And I just put up here um, the first, the entrance into one of the museum rooms the students prepared, uh, in this case, the one dedicated to the, the Syrian Church of Antioch. Uh, we, and they made their own video to start. Um, forums. In a course on the Pentateuch, students created a, a mural in a wiki that compared the biblical accounts of conquest with contemporary situations using images combined with short con comments. An important part of the decolonial turn here in Latin America requires an examination of how the biblical texts have been and continue to be invoked to justify invasion and colonization. Forums continue to be the primary tool for online interaction. Larger groups of students create opportunities for more active participation. In some courses, students have been appointed on a rotating basis to monitor a small group in a given forum. This includes posting questions to generate debate and discussion, responding to the contributions of group members, and providing a synthesis of the group's discussion for the whole class. This is just one of the many ways students are taking more responsibility for their learning process. The suspension of in-person classes and the isolation brought on by the pandemic made us aware of the need to add a synchronic component to our online courses. We did this by adding weekly or bi-weekly Zoom sessions to our courses. Not all of the people who are taking classes with the UBL have reliable access to the internet or a work schedule that allows them to participate in the Zoom sessions. Our students are spread out across many time zones, including Latin Americans who for one reason or another find themselves living in Spain or Portugal. For these reasons, we are not able to make Zoom sessions obligatory. Since our courses take place through materials and activities on the platform, the Zoom sessions are not a space for introducing new content. We are not providing online lectures. Instead, synchronous discussions allow for deeper exploration of specific topics. Students can voice their questions and receive ideas and encouragement from their professors and other students about where and how to seek answers. Zoom sessions also serve to build community. <clears throat> Online education has also allowed us <clears throat> to move from contextualized theological education to intercontextual theological education in real time. 
From the time the essay Bailey became independent of the Latin American mission, contextualized theological education has been a hallmark of our institution. We have strived to provide theological training that responds to the needs of communities throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, especially the demands of groups that have been excluded from circles of power in society and in the churches. Though we encourage students to analyze their own local contexts and construct their own theologies in response to those contexts, at an institutional level, we often refer to our context in the broadest of terms, Latin America and the Caribbean. There were certainly intercontextual aspects to the decentralized model of the UBL uh, from the time it received government authorization as a university. As had been true for decades, the decades that SBA only existed, students brought perspectives and experiences from their context to the classrooms in San Jose. By traveling to the different centers to offer intensive courses, UBL professors were able to get a taste of different contexts as well. But online education allows us to work intercontextually in real time. Students connect on Zoom from their own context. Students appear not just as faces on a screen, their homes and settings come with them to a certain extent. And we learn about the conditions in which each of us lives. A single bare light bulb hanging from a beam under a tin roof above a computer screen communicates about living condition in ways mere words cannot describe. Sometimes a student has to carry his or her cell phone to a spot up on a hillside to get to where the internet signal is strong enough to connect. And all of us get to see the surrounding countryside. <clears throat> By connecting information and analysis of what is happening in specific contexts around Latin America, we are able to deepen our reflection. For example, in a recent course on climate justice, student po students posted into a wiki images and media reports of the impacts of climate change in the areas where they live. The resulting document showed not only how widespread and varied the impacts of climate change already are at a local level, it also encouraged students to realize that their communities are not the only ones suffering. <clears throat> in another wiki in the same course, students posted information about organizations and movements working for climate justice in their own context. Thus, in addition to mapping the problem, we were able to picture the expanding movements for climate justice and ask ourselves why the religious communities were not more involved in efforts to protect the ecosystem and the human communities within them. Working online has also allowed us to expand our intercontextual connections. During one term in 2021, various institutions that make up the Latin American Community for Ecumenical Theological Education, CITELA, published a joint list of courses to encourage students to take courses at each other's institutions. Three of our students took a course through the Theological Community of Mexico and two students from the Evangelical Association for Theological Education in Lima took a course with the UVLE. Our intercultural connections also reached across the Atlantic Ocean. On two occasions, faculty members and students from the Augustana Hochschule, a seminary of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Bavaria, participated in a month long unit of one of our courses. In this case, both the faculty members and students from Germany spoke Spanish. Language differences remain a great challenge for our efforts to expand our intercontextual connections. Before the pandemic, we held monthly lectures or theological discussions here at the UBL for a local audience. In recent years, we also began to transmit these events via Facebook Live or to videotape them to present later on our YouTube channel. As the pandemic isolated people in their homes, we felt an urge to offer a space for theological and pastoral reflection on what people were experiencing. We began to hold bi-weekly seminars online. The topics we explored in 2020 included compassion in the time of COVID with Juan, the Spanish theologian Juan Jose Tamayo, bodies, rituals, and, and grief with our former president, Violeta Rocha, COVID-19's impact on women in Latin America by communication specialist, Charo Rosales, COVID-19 and Pentecostal spirituality with Chilean theologian, Elizabeth Salazar 
Sansana, among others. Holding these seminars on Zoom allows for dialogue as participants from different contexts have the opportunity to interact with presenters. For 2021, we moved to a monthly forum. In 2021 as well, our green team also began to organize conversations on climate justice online. In these events, students and graduates of the UVL interact with faith-based activists from around Latin America and the Caribbean. An activist from Costa Rica spoke of the impacts from the expansion of pineapple production. A speaker from Action by Churches Together Alliance or ACT helped us to understand how the vulnerability of communities to the impact of climate change is historically and socially constructed. When a lawyer from Iglesias y Minería, Churches and Mining in Peru spoke of the environmental and human damages caused by mines in the Andes, a student in the Zoom meeting shared what it is like for her to pastor church in a community where a mine dominates all local economic activity and people accept by environmental degradation with its concomitant health effects as necessary and inevitable. We also realized that we needed to offer more to our students. Prior to the pandemic, the Student Pastoral Care Office provided support just to the students who were in residence in Costa Rica. As cases increased throughout America and governments implemented restrictions, faculty members were increasingly in contact with students in different places who were experiencing difficulty. Initially, a letter was sent out via email to all students encouraging them to contact the Pastoral Care Office to receive accompaniment. A few students reached out, but not very many. At the same time, faculty was aware that all of our students in one way or another were being affected by the pandemic. Online support groups emerged as a strategy to provide a pastoral accompaniment to a larger number of people. The pastoral care team consisted of our vice president, Dr. Edwin Mora, who is a trained psychologist as well as a theologian, Professor Ruth Bindis, the director of pastoral care, Mia Umania, a student with extensive experience in trauma counseling, and Charles Rosales, the chair of the UBL's board and an expert in communication who has done work with women's groups throughout Latin America. All of the students were invited to join one of the groups. For those who did participate, these groups became an important source of moral support. Students who felt alone realized that other people were living, having similar experiences such as the illness and death of family members or the loss of employment. They discovered that they were not the only ones feeling helplessness, anger, and despair. Students were able to share with one another the strategies they had found helpful for living in pandemic times. And each session ended with a time of prayer. The support groups provided an intimate space and drew people together across physical borders. As student Isabel Casilla told me, the support groups provided an opportunity for students to get to know each other as people outside the structure of a course. The support groups also served an important pedagogical function within our pastoral education. Many of our students are already pastors and as, as such are the ones their congregations and even their families look to for answers and comfort. Church members often look on pastors as super women and super men, persons with an unending supply of power and available every hour of every day to provide care. Several people in the groups mentioned that they did not know how to handle the emotional burden of not knowing what to do to help people. In the support groups, students were able to identify and embrace their own vulnerability. They had permission to talk about the difficulties they were facing as pastors, something many of them, especially the men, had never experienced before. They were reminded that being a pastor does not mean one has to have all of the answers or provide all of the care that is needed within a congregation. The support groups also served as a model for strategy pastors could implement within their own congregations to encourage church members to care for one another. The pastoral care office also reached out to students in different ways. Digital cards were sent to students experience illness or the death of family members. We also tried to mark celebrations such as birthdays and the birth of children. 
The director of pastoral care also continued to hold individual sessions via Zoom or WhatsApp with students in need. Even when students had to drop out of classes due to illness or for other reasons, the pastoral care office continued to be in contact with them. It is a human aspect of caring that distinguishes the UBL from other institutions. Over and over again, students have mentioned to us that they have not found this kind of space anywhere else. We have grown much closer as an international community during the pandemic. There are, however, still ongoing limitations and challenges. Synchronicity remains a challenge. What at the beginning of the pandemic served as a response to the deep desire for connection in the midst of isolation has become Zoom overload for many. Perhaps some of you have felt that. In many places, in-person activities have resumed a close to normal schedule, but activities online have also continued. Students and professors find themselves overwhelmed by the, ability, the availability of so much digital content, some of which the UBL itself is producing. We have videos now, we're doing a podcast. Um, I can't keep up with it all. Our efforts to connect online continue to be plagued as well by weak and vulnerable infrastructure. One night before a Zoom session, I received a note via WhatsApp from a student in Honduras. A truck had struck a light post and taken out the flow of electricity to her entire barrio. Power outages routinely interfere with our work online, even here in Costa Rica. In Peru, where public and private schools were holding classes remotely during the pandemic, the limited capacity of the internet connections left several of our students with insufficient bandwidth to connect via Zoom. A student in Awas on the Caribbean coast of Honduras was left without a computer when the floodwaters of Hurricane Iota damaged his laptop. All aspects of life, not only theological education, will become more difficult as the effects of climate change are more widely felt. The digital gap also remains a reality. Despite so much online activity during the pandemic, digital inclusion has not advanced very far. Though our platform is accessible on a variety of devices, it is very difficult to do university level academic work on, our, on a smartphone, though some of our students try. Along with the digital gap, we are concerned about a growing gender gap that is affecting other institutions of higher learning and not just the UBL. In recent decades, the number of women studying at the UBL has been on par with the number of men. We ended 2019 with 83 students, 41 of whom were women. By the second term of 2020, that is May to August, the student body had grown to 132 with 58 women and 74 men. In 2021, we had 149 students, but only 54 of whom or 36% were women. This trend has continued this year. We know that the pandemic pushed many women out of the labor force. Much of the burden of care for those who became ill fell to women who also had to, over, to assume overseeing the education of women, of children who were not able to go to school. We hope this trend will be reversed, but thus far we see no evidence of that happening. Government regulation and oversight of online education remains a challenge. The National Council for higher, Private Higher Education, CONESU, the regulatory body that oversees private universities has been inconsistent in the criteria it uses to evaluate online programs. After two years of the pandemic, CONISUB is finally showing some flexibility toward the use of digital um, bibliography on online courses. The slow bureaucratic processes uh, have not kept up with the technological changes and pedagogical advances of online education. Um, now for some concluding thoughts. For the UBL, the future of, of theological education lies online. Uh, we are convinced of this. Students will continue to come to Costa Rica from other countries to meet graduation requirements, such as the 150 hours of volunteer service in country that the government requires of all persons receiving any university degree below a master's. 
However, we think students will probably spend less time in residence and the groups will be smaller. <coughs> so they will still be welcome to come to Costa Rica to take classes or do research for their theses. It will not be required. Undoubtedly, there is much that is lost at, in having a, a less culturally diverse presence in our classrooms and on our campus. Wonderful interactions happen, for example, when a Pentecostal pastor and a Roman Catholic nun find themselves sitting next to each other in class. The initial distrust is overcome when they reflect together on what it means to follow Jesus Christ in Latin America today. Online, people can maintain more distance from each other if they choose to do so. It is also impossible to replicate online the depth of intercultural learning that takes place by living in the same residential space, smelling the smells of each other's cooking and discussing theology around the dining room table late into the night. Life in the residence hall was also a space for challenging gender roles as many of our male students had to cook for themselves for the first time in their lives when they came to study in Costa Rica. But I want to end with a couple brief theological thoughts. Christ has promised to be present wherever two or three are gathered. We believe this applies to our virtual gatherings as well. This has certainly been the experience of many churches that have been meeting online during the pandemic. The creator God who wrote, wore, wrote, wove a web of life around this planet continues to weave life. The triune one who exists in relationship and as relationship moves among us, even through the ether of cyberspace to weave us into relationships with one another. And I close with this image. This is a painting that hangs in the entryway of the, uh, our main administration building on our campus in Costa Rica. It shows the weaving together of our community, people from many cultures um, coming together to be part of, of this educational community that we call the uh, Universidad Biblica Latinoamericana. Thank you very much for allowing me to share our experience. Your presentation, I found it very interesting and I liked what you said about how UBL uh, developed and grew in Costa Rica with a Bible with the women's Bible training school and how they allowed the man to join them. And slowly now you have UBL, which has both, where you have both men and women studying together. And now you're, as you slowly moved into an online and in a more diversified distance program because of the pandemic situation, and that has been increased. And I also picked up that you are saying that UBL is trying to grapple with the contextual problems which is happening in the real life situation and that theologians as well as academicians and church leaders are trying to are grappling with the questions and trying to uh, feed it into the wider community of Christians. So I found that very helpful. And then I also can sort of, I think most of us can also resonate with what you said about online teaching that it's helpful. And then it also leads to some creative innovations in way of how you are teaching and sharing and interacting with one another, but that's still that there is a gap, especially that it brings in about the, you know, the gap of uh, what do you call uh, digital inclusiveness is still not there. And also the gap that has, that has widened between the man and the women, because from your example, you've showed that women are being pushed as push, push out of, you know, education, online education, because now they are more into uh, or they have the responsibility and the task of caring for the home and the family. So that is one good example that you have brought up as to how there is still a uh, lack of inclusivity in all sphere and level of education, and especially now with the uh, online education. And you also talk about how uh, the 
pandemic had also brought to the fore in your context, the climate change and the climate justice issue where everyone can participate and share images and also not just images, but reflections and also like real life stories across each other, across what would I call across the channel in the <laughs> through Zoom <laughs> with each other and not just uh, read it from books. Uh, and I also really like what you said about the support group and the pastoral office that is working online where they're supporting the pastors who feel that or who are encouraged to embrace their vulnerability and not just play the role of superhuman who knows all the answers and can deal with all problems, but they too face the problems which is faced by everyone else and that they too are human. So I think with that, I will open the floor for questions, but I do think that there are uh, several aspects and levels uh, uh, where we can have a discussion, further discussion. And so now I open the floor for questions and comments. Yeah, I see Michael. Yeah, thanks a lot, Carla, for this uh, very impressive and um, uh, rich uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to make one comment and ask one question. The comment is, I think, um, if I remember it correctly, then Marina had in her first opening lecture about the hospitality made us aware that one of the problems of online teaching is actually that what is not said or what is not showed in a picture is not present. And I think you refer to that experience when you say how difficult it is that in this kind of intercultural communication, we are reduced to language and we, you, know, you, you mentioned the loss of smell of food, uh, <laughs> shared food and things like that. And I think you are, I, I, I suffer from that. So I have more contact with people around the world, but we're just reduced to a tile on the screen and what we can say about it. So I think that's really an issue if we look into uh, the, the future for online theological education, uh, how to deal with that aspect. The question I would like to ask is about this model that you have been presenting the community of inquiry. And um, I may have missed something in your lecture, but could you say a few words more about uh, the, the distribution of this field, so to say, social presence, cognitive presence, teaching presence to persons? Um, I mean, is it meant that the teaching present is the teacher or is it also the students? So how is it how okay, are that's, that's a, distributed that, to the different yeah, personalities? Uh, and how do they uh, contribute to weaving, uh, mm -hmm. to this weaving? And I would like to hear a little bit more about what you do online with this model. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah. I think that that's a very good point. Everyone engages in the, as teacher, we are all learning together and teaching one another. Um, the teaching presence in this case refers much more to the, the facilitation aspect of um, that, that we, um, you know, we're the ones who are putting the courses together. So we are the ones who are, are, uh, convoking and managing the social presence. So we are the ones structuring those, those possibilities for interaction. Uh, we are also the ones who choose the, the uh, cognitive presence or the materials and also the way the materials are processed by, by the community. Um, so one of the, uh, in the literature, one of the complaints often of, of um, online education is the lack of, <laughs> the students often complain about it, the lack of teacher input. Um, mm. And and I think that's, that's mm. uh, especially a, true for students who are used to going to classes with a lecture format. Mm. And now they're, now they're on, you know, in, online and have to, uh, read the materials for themselves and not necessarily have a professor tell them what they're supposed to get out of it <laughs> and, um, and draw their own conclusions. Um, so we've done with that, um, you know, there is a need uh, to have a, an active uh, professorial presence um, on, on the platforms. We do that 
in different ways. Um, some people uh, do a might do a video um, that we ask people to watch before the Zoom session, uh, sort of professor's take on the material that we're looking at, um, or, or um, others have used, and I've used at times, short um, sound clips, just something that, that you know, uh, encourages people to, to connect. Um, so that's, um one of one of the issues it, the um the desertion rates for online education are much higher for than for classroom education and part of the problem is the the lack of effective ties that are generated so trying to think about how to to do that the zoom sessions have helped us a great deal in, in building those kinds of connections and, and People now know that, that their absence is noticed. I mean, we really want them present. Um, so we've worked on that. Um, and it depends on so the level of the class and, and engagement. There are um, some classes where, you know, we've actually built, collect, have collectively built a bibliography where students will also be hunting for bibliographical materials to share with one another. Um, they, uh, it's a little, and we have had uh, students also prepare, prepare presentations for each other um, on different topics that, that's one of my frustrations. I feel that that works a lot less well than it used to work in a classroom, right? When people would, you know, uh, but we try. We try, we try to do that. Um, there are a couple that I, I didn't include that I, have been thinking a lot about a couple areas where I find uh, we we still struggle, um, and I don't have good answers. One is the teaching people how to write. Um, many of our students come from experiences of second ed secondary education that have not provided them with the skills they need for university level work. So uh, often they're. And many, many of our students, Spanish is not their first language. It might be their third language. So how do we online um, provide processes that can uh, help people gain those skills that they, they really do need? And I think it's our, our responsibility as a university to provide them. Uh, we, are, we are working, we have, we have just, um, we have a, working with a Spanish professor now who's helping us. And the other thing that is hard is trying to figure out how to how to teach people how to do research mm. online. Um, we um, we're also working on that, but that's been um, one of the limitations of online. And this was also true of the distance courses in the past. People receive a package of material. <laughs> I think that that's what. You know, then they work through that package. They work through the readings that are put on the platform, and they and and, um, so and they how to, yeah, and they're not out looking for materials themselves. And and I've come to realize that um, a lot of our students are not reading theology beyond what texts are assigned in class. It's like, oh, we've got to help people get excited about reading theology and looking for other things to read, and that's one of the Things we have to start with. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank question. you, Carla. Uh, good job. Yeah. Thank you, Carla, for your excellent lecture. And um, I agree with you that we are being forced to move on to online education more and more. It's not only because of the pandemic situation, but also we are in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, so our society is moving in that direction. Everything is digitalized and we are moving on to online. But on the other hand, as you know, you know, theological community is very much rigid and we still want to do everything in the way that we have been doing for centuries. <laughs> so very much you know, contradictory here. Um, I read an article about one PhD student in Australia and she refused to write her thesis in the traditional way but she produced seven different video clips for her seven chapters. Mm -hmm. 
So she submitted seven videos for her thesis and she passed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my question is that how we can challenge our theological community to be more flexible, to be more creative and innovative in this time of digitalization? Yeah, I think that's really important. We have, have um, you know, students have often submitted coursework via video. Um, I had an experience that I didn't include where um, I, I was teaching the, the second part of our history of Christianity survey that starts with the Reformation on, and we did a, a documentary on the 16th century. So I assigned each group of each student a particular topic, you know, uh, Calvin in Geneva, you know, the Radical Reformation, Luther, <laughs> um, Jesuit efforts in, 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 in the Far East. Um, and uh, um, so it was a very, and they had, so they had to do, they, I gave them each some readings and told them you need to do some additional research. Uh, they had to think about what to include. How do you present historical material to a, a general audience? Um, what, what's important? How do you communicate the theological uh, issues that were involved? So I, I think there's a lot of room for innovation. Uh, we also, um, uh, and this is, has been approved by the government, we have a, another process for uh, graduation papers that is not a thesis. Um, it's a, a graduation seminar. And in the seminar, a small group, three or four students will, they'll work together on a, a, a theoretical framework. And then each one of them does a project that responds to their own context. So some people have done like um, pedagogical guides for working with youth. Or we did have a, a, a woman do a series of videos. Um, and, and so we need to continue to be a lot more creative. Um, I, I, I'm teaching right now a course on feminist historiography in our, in our master's program that we work uh, do with the National University. And their um, students, uh, pick a woman who has been uh, considered a saint by the Roman Catholic Church for, for the topic of their historical study. And there's a, there's a creative component to the final paper, so uh, to the final project. So they, I've gotten letters written to these women saints. I've gotten um, poems and, and uh, song, original songs and, and so there's, there's a lot of room for creativity and, and we need to continue to open ourselves up to that, certainly. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Alfred, oh, sorry. Alfred, and then we'll have Damon. Carla, you were going to continue, yeah. No, I just say, um, I think we also need to, um, that cannot become a, a, a reason for not teaching people how to write well and communicate in writing. But. Of course. <laughs> Carla, many thanks and congratulations we, for the way you've come so far. We in Chile um, still have a hard time with simple accreditation. And so I have a question for you about that. And then one that's more missio theological. Mm -hmm. The question on accreditation, you see, we in Chile, you mentioned you'd have trouble with the government, but as Ministries of education across Latin America become more and more exigent, more and more um, developed in their thinking. They, they see theological education as an area they cannot accredit. How have you got over that in Costa Rica? Because it sounds like you have. Uh, yeah, have to... yeah. Um, um, <laughs> Costa Rica is a really interesting context, well, right? We are still a, a confessional state. Yeah. So, so <laughs> the From Roman the Catholic on. Church is still <laughs> the official state religion. Uh, oh. you know, we, we are an institution with an evangelical background uh, or Protestant background. Um, there is, I, I think one of the things that helps us here is that, that 
uh, the National University, which is a state institution, has a department of um, it's the Ecumenical School of uh, Religious Sciences, but they also teach theology. And so there's an experience here in Costa Rica of a state institution that teaches theology. We have had, um, back when we were still the, the, the seminario, we had a relationship with the, the national university uh, that, that uh, accredited our degrees. So that right. has that historical relationship has helped us a great deal. Okay, uh, so your, your graduates are professionals who can uh, work in that accredited way, great. Well done, right. we're, we're, all, we're working on that. Um, the other one, it relates to what we used to also, we were involved with, you know, uh, the um, distance learning, well, SEAN, Seminario por Extensión a Todas las Naciones, SEAN, Seminary by Social Relationships with Tony Barrett, I happened to marry his daughter, so I was part of that. Mm -hmm. But nearer to you, we had George Patterson with his TEEE -E -E in the north of Honduras, it became quite famous and we had to work on that too. Yeah? And, and I liked his concept which again, online finds difficult, but I think it's possible, which is uh, what he calls obedience-oriented education. So that he would teach on evangelism and then they would go and do it through his materials. And something like that Professor Beale was talking about last week, you know, this unacceptable divorce of, between theology and mission, which he's trying hard to bring together. I think it's unacceptable. However, online, We've found, like you, we now have, say, like in one local church, 500 Bible students, where for there are only 200. It's easy to do Bible study in pajamas, and you don't go out, so that works wonderfully. Uh, but uh, as our, uh, what, what say our other students who are theological students, we seek always to keep this idea that you study and you do mission, you don't divorce the two, so that hopefully... How have you handled that online? How have your students not just got this stuffy idea that you've got to learn, 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 but that <clears throat> all Christian learning is to go, goes to praxis eventually? Do you manage that? Um, one, I would say that, that people are, are in their, their own context. So... Yeah. Um, and most of our students already are pastoring, are engaged in, in, in mission in different ways. So they often um, don't, they often are still stuck thinking that mission is what, you know, foreigners from, people who come from outside the community do in their community. So um, our mission course really focuses on helping people understand that no, every every follower of Jesus Christ is sent into the world in mission, right? Um, right. That's been the pandemic um, is an occasion for serious missiological reflection. If you can't leave your home, in what way are you still being sent into the world by Jesus? Because the yeah. the, the sending hasn't changed, uh -huh. even though your circumstances have changed, right? So um, we've engaged that way. Um, we, uh, you know, we don't, we come out of a historical experience where um, both, you know, the Latin American evangelization campaign, then you know, the Latin American mission started evangelism in depth in, in the late 1950s, um, the, the, where in which the, the mobilization of all church members has been first and foremost, and, and uh, the, it's an, a commitment to make theological education accessible, not just to those who are in pastoral ministry has been really important. Um, I think in our case, people are engaged in, in, in so much pastoral and, and missional work mm -hmm. um, for the most part. Um, we don't, we're not producing, you know, scholars who have the luxury of just sitting right. and studying. That's not possible. It, it's almost the other way around in Latin America, isn't it? That they need theological reflection. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank, yeah. You. thank you. I am going to privilege Israel before Damon, who has raised his okay. hand first. So Israel first. <laughs> Israel? 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Car Carla, for the nice, good presentation and a very important topic, very actual in the sense that um, we are all moving towards that. The, 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 the questions remain about how to use it uh, uh, in a way that will enrich the, the productivity of education. Uh, mm. uh, are we going to gain more than before? Uh, are we going to lose more than before in the presential or physical presence? Uh, tradition or methodology of teaching or should we try to get a combination of both these questions around uh, this topic but i was thinking about um, uh, the issue of uh, communication and using the digital methodology um, especially uh, i was thinking about the difference of uh, the cultural communication between people who could be in a way mechanically <laughs> for, to say the, uh, connected um, uh, in the intercultural communication we have this uh, kind of um, uh, categories of high context communication and low context communication mm -hmm. and the countries some countries uh, are a kind of low context communication because they, they are very good at talking or they use just words uh, to communicate or mainly words, while other uh, high context cultures, they use many other details while they communicate. Yeah. So how, how, how could we, in a way, keep the fairness of communication so it will not be a kind of dominance of those who come from a, uh, a low context communication, those who speak very directly, Mm -hmm. and, um, and and I was thinking about that the importance of it of equality of fairness because in some culture mm -hmm. it, cultures even the, the the women are not so um, you know in a accepted position to argue as equal as men so we have to work on this issue of fairness and sometimes when you are present, uh, you read those uh, signs and you can do something about it. How could we, in a way, while we use this digital means, try to produce a fairness in communication, taking in consideration the interculturality? Mm -hmm. That was my point. Yeah, um, and that's a very, very good point. Thank you, Israel. Um, it's uh, and that's, um, I, I did not get into my lecture, you know, how we are thinking about um, building interculturality um, in, at the UBL, and, and it is tough. Um, there are some, some strategies that, that are offered for work in person that can, can, can work online. Um, Creating those safe spaces where where people who are are reticent um, to to talk or who are not accustomed to talk are are provided that space. Um, I, I think it requires continual vigilance, um, and I think we we need to continue to learn from each other what what how to uh, improve. The online experience and make it more equitable, um, so that everyone feels included. Um, that, that that that's hard. Um, um, we we find it online and in our classrooms as well. Women who who are are so um, unsure. Uh, of being able to offer an opinion because the, their opinions have never been welcomed mm -hmm. before. Um, and so it, it, it's, I, I think we still need to do a lot of work and, and to think about how uh, you know, this digital age kind of flattens communication in some ways um, and how, how, the, how can we make it fuller? It's a really good question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Damon? Yes, um, you know, the old model of distance learning is that um, 
the, the, the seminary send out materials for the student. It can be anywhere in the world. The student read the material, put an essay question, write the essay, send the essay to the lecturer. The lecturer market send it back. You know, they never need to really talk to one another except via the written communication. But now with online teaching, uh, the whole game has changed. So we can have much more opportunity to interact with one another, you know, at, you know, student to student interaction and students and faculty interaction. And so I, I wonder, I caught a little bit of what you said, but please elaborate a bit more. How, how important is this kind of uh, mutual interaction in your uh, online uh, teaching? Uh, that is, or, or how important is the online communion? Uh, <laughs> using a, a, a theological word, how important is online communion in your teaching and how is it facilitated? And, and, and lastly, what kind of software features enable us to create that kind of online communion? Yeah, I like that phrase, online communion. It's very nice. Um, yeah, we, um, you know, I, I tried to point to the different ways we encourage interaction. Um, it is vital uh, to uh, that online interaction uh, is, creates the effective ties that make for effective learning. Um, so it's, it's very important. Uh, so what we've, we've done thus far, uh, the use of forums and it, it the, the experience with forums has been varied. Um, some groups get really gun ho and they're going back and forth, you know, and, and uh, you know, I'll jump in with, you know, have you all thought about this? And then they go on. <laughs> um, and other groups, it's, it's literally like pulling teeth. They just, you know, some, they'll, they'll put their, their initial contribution and, and that's it. You can't get them to interact at all. <laughs> uh, uh, the, um, I have not had any luck with collaborative writing online, but doing work with images, um, like in, in a wiki posting images, I had one group that was working on um, uh, intersectionality. So, you know, each, each person posted an image and, and explained why it represented intersectionality for them. And then they were able to converse about that online. Um, there's no substitute for, for, for Zoom meetings, having a chance to, to talk. Um, you can get a sense of, of, of um, you know, how people are feeling. They're up or down or you know, really stressed out. And, and that's important to be able to respond to each other at a personal level. Um, there are other tools on Moodle that we haven't explored very much yet uh, that offer uh, opportunities for, for interaction. Um, I think we need to continue to grow in that way and, and find more, more tools that can encourage different kinds of interaction. Um, so that's a, an area of growth, certainly. So, so mainly you have been using forum and wiki for interaction, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, so uh, thank you very much, Carla, for the presentation. And I think, uh, I just wanted to talk, get back to what you said about, because you mentioned quite a few times about climate change and how that comes to the fore in the online uh, sharing and uh, so how has that changed? I mean, like climate change has always been one of the issues that has come out, you know, that has always been talked about from Latin America. So has that changed or is there more or it's, uh, how has that helped? How has online teaching actually helped? You said it comes to the fore, but what exactly, where exactly lies the change in terms of uh, priority, prioritizing it as an issue or how do you, are you, have you, started theologizing more on it or just, yeah. Yeah, um, 
we've been working on on um, issues of, around climate change back in uh, several years ago now we as we were reflecting as a as a community as an institution what would be our 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 both side what are what are what are we being called to do uh, um, and the the three areas that we are focusing on are gender justice um, planetary life and economies of well-being and so thinking about what's happening to planetary life climate justice has really come to the fore in in recent years as as we listen to the concerns that students bring um, and we watch what's happening here in Costa Rica. Um, Costa Rica had not uh, had a hurricane touched land here uh, since they kept start keeping records of hurricanes in 1851. Um, and, and we've had two in the last five years. Um, so things are, are um, it's becoming more and more obvious that, that climate change is, is seriously affecting our communities that, Hurricanes Eta and Iota that hit um, Nicaragua and, and well, most of Central America, Nicaragua uh, was directly hit, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala all suffered effects. Two hurricanes within three weeks of each other in November of, of 2020, um, which pointed to the vulnerability of, of, of this geographical region. So it's it's I, I think it's going, it is the, the primary missiological challenge, pastoral challenge that our students will face in their communities over the next couple of decades. And we need to be training church leaders to understand it and, and with the tools to respond um, and to work on creating resilient, adaptive communities. Um, it's going to get so much worse and we're not ready. Yes, so thank you very much, Carla, for your presentation and also to all those who have participated in by us uh, making comments and sharing questions to us. And yeah, and yeah, thank you for being there, all of you via Zoom and also in person. And once again, thank you, Carla. And with that, we will end our session, our lecture today. And next week, we will be having a presentation by Johan from South Africa. So you're all welcome to come and join us again. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right.